In this video, we're going to take a look at the physiological control of the menstrual cycle and specifically ovulation. Uh, in order to have a better idea of how that works, we're going to look specifically at the key players and how they interact with each other. So first we need to outline some of the anatomy. So the hypothalamus is going to be one of the primary control centers that's going to allow for this process to take place. The second key area that we need to be mindful of is the anterior pituitary gland because this is where, this is where hormones like luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are going to be produced and released into the bloodstream. We also need to be mindful of the ovary as this is where many of the hormones that are being released are going to act. And then we're going to talk specifically about how these hormones uh, and, and luteinizing hormone in particular aids in ovulation. We also need to consider the developing follicle or the growing follicle because these hormones are going to stimulate growth and they're also going to promote one of these follicles to turn into the mature follicle. And then finally we need to talk about the corpus luteum and this is going to be the final piece of the puzzle after the egg has been released and we're going to talk about the hormones that are released from the corpus luteum prior to fertilization of an egg. The first hormone we're going to look at is GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone. This hormone is produced in the hypothalamus and uses the hypophysal portal system in order to stimulate release of hormones from the anterior pituitary gland. So GnRH is created in the hypothalamus. It travels down blood supply towards the anterior pituitary gland where it will stimulate release of FSH and LH uh, from the anterior pituitary gland. The next two hormones that we're going to look at are follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Both of these hormones are produced in the anterior pituitary gland which they'll, where they'll be released into the bloodstream to have their effect on the body. Follicle stimulating hormone in particular is going to play a primary role in stimulating the growing follicles within the ovaries. What this means is we have varying stages of follicle development occurring in the ovary. We have those primordial follicles, some primary, some secondary. And as follicle stimulating hormone stimulates these growing follicles, it's going to cause them to move further along their development cycle. So some of our primordial follicles may turn into primary follicles, where other primary follicles may turn into secondary follicles. It's important to note here that as we have the development or growth of these follicles, only one follicle will generally be the mature follicle or the follicle that's going to release its ovum in the ovary at one time. So another role that we need to consider in terms of follicle stimulating hormone in the ovary is its effect on these follicles that are not becoming the mature follicle. What that means is follicle stimulating hormone is going to promote growth of some of these primary follicles into secondary follicles that may not be the mature follicle for this uh, upcoming round of ovulation. These follicles that are in the secondary stages though play an important role because they are going to be the ones that take a supportive uh, position in menstruation and they begin the release of estrogen. So when we start talking about the actual pathway or the progression through the menstrual cycle, we start with this follicle stimulating hormone that's going to promote the growth and development of a mature follicle and it's also going to allow these supporting follicles to develop in order to release estrogen. The next hormone that we're going to begin talking about is luteinizing hormone and the effect of luteinizing hormone on ovulation. So whereas follicle stimulating hormone is going to promote the growth and development of follicles, estrogen is going to result in an increasing amount of luteinizing hormone being released. And around day 14 we have this peak in luteinizing hormone levels which are going to lead to two things. We're going to see an increase in prostaglandin release which is going to cause swelling of the ovum so that mature follicle is going to begin to swell and we're also going to see the release of proteolytic enzymes. The job of those proteolytic enzymes is going to be to break down the follicular wall and that swelling and breakdown of the wall leads the follicle to burst and we're going to see ovulation. So as that follicle bursts we start to see the ovum released uh, from the ovary. After ovulation the follicle is going to turn into the corpus luteum and luteinizing hormone is going to continue to play a role in stimulating that corpus luteum. The job of the corpus luteum is to maintain hormone secretion until either fertilization does not occur or until the placenta forms following fertilization. So as luteinizing hormone is released and stimulating the corpus luteum after ovulation, it's going to help promote secretion of hormones that are going to maintain an adequate environment for fertilization and if the egg is fertilized, those hormones are going to maintain an adequate environment for the fetus to begin development. 
Now we're going to move our discussion to the secondary hormones, or hormones that require the release of follicle-stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone in order to promote their release during the menstrual cycle. The four that we're going to talk about are estrogen. Estrogen is one of the primary hormones involved in the menstrual cycle and promoting the release of an egg. We're going to look at progesterone, which plays a role in the later half of the menstrual cycle. We're going to look at relaxin, which also plays a role in the later half of the menstrual cycle. And then we're going to look at inhibin, which plays a role throughout the entirety of the menstrual cycle. So we're first going to talk about the function of estrogen. As we mentioned before, estrogen begins to be released from our developing follicles or our supporting follicles after one has become mature. So we have that release of follicle stimulating hormone that causes one follicle to become mature and the rest become supportive. And these supportive follicles are going to release estrogen and that estrogen is going to play an important role in the anterior pituitary gland. So we see the estrogen released from the supporting follicles. It's going to travel to the anterior pituitary gland and it's actually going to promote the release of luteinizing hormone while inhibiting the release of follicle stimulating hormone. So as our follicles develop and as we see those supporting follicles develop, we see them releasing much more estrogen in order to promote the release of luteinizing hormone and it's ultimately this luteinizing hormone that's going to cause ovulation. So again to reiterate, it's the follicle stimulating hormone that's promoting the growth of these follicles. As we have the mature follicle develop, we start to see the rest of our secondary follicles becoming secretory, and that's where this estrogen becomes released and promotes the release of luteinizing hormone. Another role of estrogen is to uh, promote the development of female secondary sex characteristics. So as we have increased levels of estrogen in the body, we're going to see increased uh, amounts of those secondary sex characteristics. And then finally, more related to the menstrual cycle, the release of estrogen is going to help promote engorgement of the striatum functionalis. Or what that's going to do is the more estrogen we have released, or as we see these increasing amounts of estrogen being released, we start to see the striatum becoming engorged with blood and thickening. And this is just uh, going to help the uterus promote the optimal environment for implantation of an egg. The next hormone we can look at is inhibin. So inhibin is going to be released from those developing follicles or those supporting follicles as well. And one of the core jobs of inhibin is to inhibit the release of follicle stimulating hormone. So as we've gotten to the point where estrogen levels are rising and we're starting to see an increase in luteinizing hormone, we don't need follicles to be developing. So inhibin is released to decrease the amount of follicle stimulating hormone. It's important to note here that it also is going to, to a lesser extent, inhibit luteinizing hormone, but importantly, because of the high levels of estrogen that are being released at this time, we actually start to see a spike in our luteinizing hormone levels. They're not going to fall. We now want to move to talking about the hormones that are going to be released from the corpus luteum. And it's important to note that the egg has now been released. So if the egg has been released, we're waiting for fertilization. So the corpus luteum's job in between this period of waiting for fertilization and fertilization is to release all four of these hormones in order to prepare the body for implantation of the fertilized egg. So all four of these hormones are going to increase as we have formation of the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum will continue to release these hormones until we have egg fertilization where it will then continue on until the placenta forms or until there's no fertilization the corpus luteum will die off and the corpus albaceans will form. So one of the hormones released from the corpus luteum is progesterone. Progesterone is going to increase preparation of the striatum functionalis. So now we have estrogen and progesterone being released which is going to very much engorge the striatum functionalis with blood. It's going to thicken the endometrium and it's going to allow the perfect environment for implantation. We're also going to see an increase in uh, milk preparation. So the mammary, gl mammary glands at this point are going to be prepared for the preparation mil of milk in case there is fertilization. And we're also going to see the inhibition of GnRH and luteinizing hormone. So we don't need to have the release of GnRH. We don't need follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone to being re be released at this point because the egg has already uh, been released from the ovary. So we're starting to decrease the, all of those hormones and now prepare for implantation implementation or implantation instead. The other thing that we're going to see is the release of uh, relaxin. Relaxin is going to inhibit uh, contractions and we actually when we were seeing relaxin being released during uh, during pregnancy or during partuation or the birth of the baby we start to see an increased flexibility of the symphysis pubis. So relaxin is basically being released to inhibit contractions because we don't have want contractions occurring until we're ready to birth the baby. 
So again, if we can provide an overview of this process from the top, it's GnRH that's going to start by releasing follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. We have a huge increase or a large release of follicle-stimulating hormone in the initial stages of the menstrual cycle, which is going to cause our follicles to develop. So we start to see follicles moving along the developmental stage until we have one becoming mature. The rest become secretory and they start releasing estrogen. This estrogen is going to inhibit the release of follicle-stimulating hormone while also increasing the release of luteinizing hormone. As we mentioned, that luteinizing hormone is going to lead to an increase in prostaglandins and proteolytic enzymes, which are going to increase the release or potenti potentiate the release of an ovum. From there, we have the corpus luteum form, which is going to release estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin. And we're going to see inhibin decreasing the amount of luteinizing hormone that is being released. And now our estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin can take over as the primary hormones that are going to prepare the uterus for implantation, and if fertilization occurs, that corpus luteum is going to continue on to prepare the body for the formation of the placenta.